Uh, so in order to just uh, may get started on the right foot, then just leave behind what's gone is gone. The future also doesn't exist really. It's just a matter of projection and conception. And even the present is just merely projected. The moment we have the present, it's gone. So even to find the present is really, really difficult. So what is it that exists in front of us now? Mostly it's projection, hallucination. So the good news is if it's hallucination, then we can make it our hallucination. We can make whatever you want. And since uh, the conventional law is the law of cause and effect, what we do now will have an effect. So if you would like to have even better things in the future, like a fully developed mind, a peaceful mind, a wise mind, a compassionate mind, then the time we spend together, let's just dedicate, uh, well, motivate that we, this not just lead a more intellectual understanding, but actually lead to a pure relationship with the spiritual guide so that we may attain full awakening for the benefit of all living beings. It will give us a skillful means, wisdom, and kind heart to do that. Okay. So um, I want to mention something here. So the, uh, the way that the, that the spiritual path is, or spirituality is being explored and, and these days, there's, there's become a shyness, a reluctance to present much depth to students um, or to pre present depth in kind of, uh, you know, with traditional material. So, so sometimes there's a bit of, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Not, not uh, embarrassment, kind of be embarrassment. Uh, and so we water down the teachings. Okay. And Barbara, I know you've been, you've been involved pretty much the past year, right? Yeah, I would say since the beginning of this year. Was, yeah, was so that's good. That's good because what happens tends to happen. I asked Dundrup last week, what percentage of the people are coming to the classes for, you know, kind of the intro public um, curiosity level? He said 75%, which I thought was really fascinating. Um, it's kind of sad too. So we, we need to cater to the 25% as well i think what's happened uh is what's happened is we're we're catering more to the 75 percent. so our 75 percent is growing in number but uh there's a big question about what well there's definitely benefit there you know because people get to hear these ideas and they go, but the benefit really doesn't come to you start to practice and that's where the distinction is made between like this topic, rely on a spiritual guide, it, it's for the practitioner. So that person doesn't have any real conflict with engaging in this set of these set of teachings. So it, you don't have to be so careful about the, the traditional language, perhaps. I mean, you do have to translate it, there's no doubt, because there's some things that are traditional uh, in the language that's, that's just sort of off putting, you know, it's hard to understand. But what seems to be happening is changing everything so that people don't have to practice. <laughs> I mean, some people say, oh, no, I practice. I do mindfulness meditation every day for 10 minutes. What do you mean? I practice, you know, well, what is the purpose of doing mindfulness meditation every day for 10 minutes? If you ask the people, and I, I'm just being prejudicial, okay, because sometimes I generalize. But for the most part, what you find people... Um, practicing, you know, some meditation, mindfulness, breathing, whatever. It is uh, for the purpose of sort of developing a healthier mind, isn't it? Hopefully. Yeah, hopefully. And that's kind of the, that's kind of the intention, isn't it? You know, yeah. they might get the idea through different workshops and different therapists or, you know, now the bad news is, and, and I know this is going to become public, so I got to, you know, so I got to own it. <laughs> so, you know, so when we talk about a Buddhist practitioner, 
So that's a big leap. That's a big decision. And that decision, when, when the decision is made to pra- be a Buddhist practitioner, dive deeper into this, uh, it has nothing to do really as a byproduct it does, but, but the intention has nothing to do with being healthier right now. I know that's a bit provocative. The motivation isn't, I want to feel better in this life. Provocative, huh? Okay, I want to do this Buddhism thing because, yeah, I'm, I'm Buddhist. You know, why? Oh, because I really need to have a healthier mind. Why do you want to have health? Oh, so I'm happier. I know that I'm neurotic. I know I'm depressed, right? So, so in traditional, uh, mind you, I'm talking traditional, in traditional Buddhist explanation, that is not the definition of practicing Dharma. Dharma meaning the Buddhist path or spiritual path. So that's pretty heavy because you don't, you don't go around telling people that in this culture. They come to your mindfulness class and you're going to promise them that when it works, you know, they might get less depressed. They might get less anxious. They might be able to focus better so that they have more meaningful. They may be able to have a calmer mind, which is all that's good, right? But now we're going, we're in a traditional class now. So we have to make a distinction that 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 is not a Buddhist, that is not a, a practice, a, pra, a Buddhist practice or yeah, a Buddhist practice not defined by the practice. Okay, we all get hung up on that. Oh, I'm doing Buddhist meditation. Oh, I'm doing uh, Buddhist prostrations. I'm doing Buddhist water bowl. It, it, that's cultural stuff. That's not Buddhist stuff. Okay. So to make it Buddhist or not Buddhist is not whether you're doing meditation, prostrations, water bowl offerings, reciting prayers, nothing to do with that. That's the big aha for people. Okay. It has to do with your motivation. And the lowest motive, there are levels of motivation that, that can be captured as Buddhist. And when I say Buddhist, now let's be clear, I'm talking not about the religion, I'm talking about the mindset that says, I'm ready to seek enlightenment. Okay. Now, you don't, it doesn't have necessarily be enlightenment as much as, for, so in traditional, now we're talking tradition, for traditional practice to be Buddhist, it has to be focused on a goal beyond the the happiness of this life. It does not exclude the happiness of this life, of course. I mean, you know, it's not the idea, okay, I'll torture myself this life for my next life. No, that's not the point. People misunderstand that. It means not focus merely on this life's happiness. This life's happiness focus is is when we go to the baseball game for the most, I'm talking about, unless your intentions are, when we go out to dinner, when we go um, on a date, when we want to watch a movie with our partner or with our, go out with our kids, that's the happiness of this life. That's what's meant by that. Okay. Now you can do all of those things with your focus on the future happiness of future life or your liberation or your enlightenment. So it has to have one of those three in traditional explanation has to have one of those three as being defined as a Buddhist practice, Buddhist it's intention. Okay. Not what you do. So you can tell that for most part, conventional people uh, are do what they do because it'll make them feel happy now, right? Or, or pleasure now, or they might put off the pleasure till they finish medical school and can earn a good salary, you know, but it, that's why they say the happiness of this life. So it doesn't exclude the happiness of this life. Okay. That's very, very, very important. Okay. Luna. <laughs> There's, I always have it like, um, it all depends on the motivation. And then my short summary is, and the motivation needs to be altruistic. 
and what I'm hearing is this time is it maybe it needs to be enduring and altruistic. So it doesn't have to be altruistic, actually. Uh, that's the Mahayana. That's the high Mahayana school's aspiration or motivation. You know, in the, we have uh, the Hinayana school, right? Or the, the fundamental school, right? Theravada. Like uh, we talk about insight, Vipassana, insight, meditate. I mean, they don't have, they have great, they have a lot of compassion. So I'm, I'm not saying, you know, they're, no, they're not kind and compassionate. Of course they do. But their motivation is not from the point of view of compassion. It's not with the thought of others. It's like, I got to get the hell out of here because this is really painful and suffering, which it is. Mm -hmm. So it's not, altruism would more, if, if I'm reading you or hearing you properly, you know, that, that altruism is what's the Mahayana motivation. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, again, uh, is that what you mean by altruism? Now, altruism, you might mean something different than what I mean by it. So what do you, what do you, did I misunderstand your use of the word? I mean, what does it mean? If my, mo if my motivation is to make myself, <laughs> if my motivation is to make myself not suffer, it's so that my suffering isn't thrown upon others and I don't cause further suffering. Motive that's altruism. So you're thinking of others. For for like I want to feel better so that I don't harm. So that's thinking of others too. Thinking of others, right? Instead of I want to feel better for me, mm -hmm. which to me, just in this week, my favorite guru from Hawaii was in town. <laughs> mm -hmm, right. And and uh, became very, very uh obvious the near enemy of happiness being pleasure. Uh-huh. Right? And so I don't want to just do great things so that I feel pleasure. Right. So that's the, whatever you want to call it, because it's not very adequate, you know, I think it's better to explain. So pleasure, doing things for pleasures is what the traditional lamas, the teachers refer to as the happiness of this life. Oh. Okay. So doing things that are not merely for the for pleasure uh also not merely for pain either <laughs> but you know that's what what's referred to when you read the text they say dharma practice the lowest motivation for it to be a dharma a buddhist practice is that it least needs to be with the intention to improve the one's future life that's yeah. the lowest the second the middle one is uh, a motivation that, that defines it as a dharma practice or spiritual practice is a de devoted directed towards liberation that's the goal of the of the uh, hinayana theravada pra fundamental fundamental practitioner okay so those are all dharma actions then the with the highest goal which in the mahayana is the aspiration to attain enlightenment for the benefit of others and you get the that's benefit hinayana? the hinayana is uh, liberation seeking liberation for oneself no. because they both Hinayana and Mahayana view the situation we're in as suffering. The equal equal point of view on that. Okay, and and the high ones Mahayana then? Mahayana, yeah, the great vehicle. I mean, Hinayana don't call themselves Hinayana, so that's why we have to be careful because it means narrow school or smaller school. So that was given by the Mahayanas, no doubt. <laughs> when, so in the Hinayana, there were eighteen schools originally. The only one surviving today is the Theravada school. So sometimes we just say Theravada. And Theravada say, is low? Yeah, Hinayana means low, Mahayana, uh, narrow. Hinayana means narrow because their goal is narrow. It's for oneself, li one's liberation. Hinayana, what's the middle one? And then Mahayana? No, no, it's just two. Hinayana, Mahayana. Okay. Well, but the Hinayana motivation is the middle level motivation and the Mahayana motivation is the highest motivation. The lowest motivation is seeking the happiness of future lives. So even the Hindu have that, Christians have that, you know, Muslims have that. So it can be a spiritual practice if it's, if it's directed to um, the happiness of future life. So it's only a spiritual practice can't really be with your intention to be, feel good now or short term, this life. 
Right. So if you say, for example, to be really gross about it, um, I really want to study mindfulness. So I can become a really famous teacher and then I have a good, you know, have a, a good income. I have a good reputation. Maybe then I'll write a book and I'll get on to Oprah. Oprah's not on anywhere, but you know, that's not, so that would not be a spiritual practice. You know, you do all the same things as a Mahayana or Theravada practitioner does, or even the Hindu yogi, you know, who's directed at future lives. So <laughs> it gets a bit wobbly because we know a lot of people, you know, a lot of our friends, a lot of our community, our culture, our people are really into yoga, really into mindfulness practice. And, you know, not to be critical of them, but from this definition, they'll say, oh, yeah, I love spirituality, right? I love to practice. I'm a spiritual practitioner. So, you know, in our judge mind, judgmental, critical mind, mine, I should say, not yours, uh, I might hear that and think, well, you know, why do you do yoga? Oh, it makes me feel so good. Every morning I do it. I feel much calmer. Uh, my body feels better when I can stretch. I, you know, I get less aches and pains. And I like the breathing because I see it, it's like, like I get rid of the toxins, right? Right. So that from the strict definition is not a spiritual practice, even though they'll say they're practicing spiritually. Okay. So um, last week as well, we talked about uh, how the tradition, the Buddhist tradition, Tibetan Buddhist tradition moved in um, when it, when it was uh, forced into exile from the Chinese invasion. Then we talked about how this idea, this misunderstood idea about the spiritual teacher uh, developed, right? We talked about that last week, I believe. Um, does anyone remember where we finished last week? No? Okay. I remember, I remember Barbara's takeaway was beautiful with the art teaching and teaching kids how to draw the arms when they, that was the oh, yeah. greatest. Yeah, yeah. That was so beautiful. Mm. What was that uh, in the context of uh, a metaphor for example? Of? My kids, when she's, when they're trying to teach, correct me if I'm wrong, Barbara, when they're what, what? trying to teach children how to draw and they draw the head and the legs. Right. And then they take the children and they go do some sensory activity with their arms which brings more attention to that part of their body. And then they come back and draw again. And now those figures have arms. Right. But what was it in reference to what, what I was talking about? Yeah, I think it had to do with, you know, what you're looking for in a spiritual teacher. And so I wouldn't, I wouldn't want somebody to sit me down, if, you know, in the childhood, the child drawing example, I wouldn't yeah. want a teacher to sit me down and say, you draw arms, they go here, because I'm not going to get it. Uh, and it's seeing as spiritual de spiritual development as being a development, a developmental process right. that I would want my spiritual teacher to to see where I was like where, you know, I don't know what a spiritual development looks like. I've never I've never worked with anybody in that capacity, but I'm assuming that a guru or a teacher would and they would be able to kind of like put me on that continuum of like. This is something that you're not getting. How can I make this salient to you so you discover it and it becomes part of you? So Perfect. that was the analogy. That very I well, very well put, very well articulated. And we'll go into that exact thing tonight if I if I don't talk about other things too much. <laughs> but I can never promise. I make no promises. Okay, I'm going to share my screen here for a second. Oh, can I, um, Shayla? Can you help me be co-host? Thank you. Of course, it's not going to be here. <laughs> oh. Uh, uh, here it is. It is going to be. Everyone see that? Yeah. Okay. 
I mentioned this last week. So relying on the spiritual guy, what I want to say, I mentioned this, what I'm trying to, why I have this particular picture here or this drawing is that when the Buddha passed away, uh, he said a lot of, a number of things are very poignant, but two things he said, you know, uh, well, he said before he passed, he said, when I pass away or when I'm not here, I will manifest to you, for you, uh, through your spiritual teachers, through your lamas or your, your gurus. In other words, he didn't say, I will come back as a, as a reincarnation. You know, he didn't say that. He didn't say, um, you know, you have your videos of me, so you can watch that. He didn't say, you know, in other words, how was, how were practitioners? In other words, if we we're totally dependent on the Buddha, uh, Shakyamuni Buddha to, to pursue the spiritual path, all of us would be doomed, right? Because after his 81 years on this planet, he's gone. So of course, due to his great compassion, he would, that wouldn't happen. So how do you attain? So it was only going to be in books, for example. So he could have said, I'll live, uh, I'll, I'll guide you through my books. He could say that, could have said that. And of course, the books and the teachings are the real guide. But what he meant is in terms of his personal, um, his personal guidance, we could say. How about that? So his personal guidance, he wouldn't abandon us, is what he's saying. I'm not going to abandon you. Don't worry. But the way that I'll guide you is not by manifesting as another Buddha, you know, Shakyamuni or, or the two incarnation of that, but I will manifest through your teachers, as your teacher, through your teachers. Okay? This is where a lot of confusion now comes up. And, and we'll, we'll talk about this a lot, uh, but we'll talk about it in pieces because I can't just jump to that. So this is where in the West, I'm saying a lot of confusion. It's not very confusing for the, for the Tibetan, this, this, uh, this, this stuff, you know, and the rely on the spiritual guide. It's just built into their culture. So Shakyamuni and Buddha, let, let's, so we have to uh, be clear that, um, so what Shakyamuni Buddha was, is there's Buddha, there's, we all, every sentient being, every living being has Buddha nature. So it's a potential to become fully awakened, fully omniscient. So Buddha Shakyamuni actualized that, okay? He, he, he was, um, he, he att attaining enlightenment essentially means fully actualizing one's Buddha nature. Now, the, we do classes on Buddha nature, so it's not something I can really go into at this point much length. But, but I do want to wanna say that a lot of times I've, I've heard my friends, maybe myself included, students, uh, this is very important, by the way, um, not to go uh, give a class on Buddha nature, but I want, when we hear about Buddha nature, be very, very, very careful because because of our Judeo-Christian upbringing and because of our just education into religion and spirituality, we will take Buddha nature to mean soul, a soul, S-O-U-L. Okay. You know, like there's some enlightened nature sitting in there and waiting for us to just, you know, like a Buddha sitting in there. And then you clear it away. Ah, there's Buddha. There's my Buddha nature. Now I'm enlightened. It's not actually like that. Yes, it, it's a potential is what it is. And that potential needs to be cultivated. So that's different than saying there's an enlightened being inside of me. And this is very common. I read hear about all the time, misunderstood amongst Buddhist Dharma students, that they think there's some enlightened being inside them or their enlightened mind inside of them. They're right. There's some little jewel sitting in there. There is a little jewel sitting in there, by the way. There, there's a, there is a jewel of a, of a, of a, of a pure mind. Uh, just, just have an insight into the pure nature of the, of the subtle mind, clear light doesn't isn't enlightenment that's the problem it's like i wonder what it's like clay you know clay has the potential to be a beautiful bowl but it's not a bowl right or is it a bowl well in some ways it is but it's not re, not actualized is it so that's what the uh so the buddha nature so 
when one becomes, now every living sentient being can do that. Every living sentient being can actualize and fully develop their Buddha nature. At that time that's fully developed, you are then a Buddha. Okay, so it's not just Shakyamuni. Shakyamuni was a historical Buddha that lived more or less about 2,600 years ago. And he, he, um, he demonstrated this quality. Now, there's different, there's different um, explanations. Now, some people say, some people, some texts say he attained enlightenment under the Bodhi tree, right? After three countless eons of, of working towards it. And that was his final rebirth. And then he was a Buddha after that. There's other explanations say, well, actually, he attained enlightenment a long time before, many, many eons before that. And what he did is he, he manifested in that life uh, and showing the aspect of attaining enlightenment, even though he had already attained it. It's not that essential to say which is right. I think they're all right, right? It has to do with having different impacts on our, on our own practice, okay? So it's just interesting, isn't it? The one says uh, he was enlightened a long time ago. Another schools of thought say he, he became attained enlightenment under the Bodhi tree. The traditional teaching is that, you know, he, he sat, he meditated for six years. It was, uh, was an, a, um, an ascetic and through extreme asceticism, he had a realization that that was not the middle way. And he, he, climbed, he almost collapsed and died. And a young uh, cow, um, I don't want to say cowgirl, I guess I mean, one girl <laughs> herding her cows gave him some, uh, some curd. And then he had enough strength and he went up to the Bodhi tree that day, that night, and attained enlightenment. So that's, uh, that's, that's, so either way, what it means is his Buddha nature became fully actualized. Okay. No more work to do. Whether he had done that work for three countless gradients beforehand, whether he did that work millions and jillions of years before that and had actually attained enlightenment a long time before, it doesn't matter. He, that the same is true. Buddha is Buddha. So what it means is now, all the obstructing factors to full knowledge, okay, uh, were, were finally removed. So it's a little bit like, um, so when this, so that mind that has no obstructions to any knowledge or any knowing is, is omniscient. Because if there's no obstruction, it must be omniscient. It must be able to see everything and know everything, even at the same time. There's debates about whether uh, in the Hinayana school, the Theravada, they say that Buddha is not actually omniscient. He can, that omniscient means he knows everything, but he can't know it all at once. And then the Mahayana says he knows everything and he knows it all at once. These are just interesting debates. It's, it's not, you know, it's a matter of having that, those debates, discussions. So that, that omniscient mind that we, okay, we have the potential for it. Buddha actualized it. He's never not in the omniscient mind. You don't fall back. That's what it means to be liberated. Enlightenment is fully awakened. It means liberated. Okay. And so what I would like to say and put it imprint impress you upon you is that your guru is the Buddha. Okay. Your guru is the omniscient mind. And the good news also is there's not just one omniscient mind. I mean, that's how it looks like to in a lot of teaching, you know, that in, in this, the Shakyamuni is the only one. No, there's countless. And that's why we see in the Mahayana tradition, especially we see rep representations like of Tara and uh, anyway, all kinds, right? You see all kinds of different deities and um, icons, right? Tara, Yamataka, on and on, right? Different kinds of furious deities, kind deities, long life deities. All of those are different beings who attained omniscient mind. 
the, our karma on this planet is we have the strongest link with Shakyamuni probably because he's the most recent, he, he attained his enlightenment here. So the omniscient mind cognizes all veiled and ultimate truth simultaneously. Okay. So don't worry about this too much. I just want to, I just want to, I mean, you know, it gets very technical and we're not, we're not here for that, but I do want you to, to hold very strongly that uh, this, the practice of relying on a spiritual teacher eventually must incorporate the idea that your your guru is this omniscient mind which makes it a lot easier to relate to a physical spiritual guide it's a lot less confusing okay so when it says the purified primordial clear light mind the clear light mind we all have very subtle in our in our in our being it's almost like a soul right it's different than a soul but it, it must be my feeling is that when people people um philosophize about the soul or maybe experience it probably it was something related with the clear light mind that we possess um but that soul that clear light mind is not enlightened it's not buddha yet that's the thing that becomes Buddha in your mind, my mind. Okay. And then that, that, um, that's an omniscient quality once it attains. Now, what makes the clear light mind enlightened versus not enlightened? It's all the, it's all the mental factors, defilements that accompany it. So it's, it's like, so this clear light mind is like the sky, which the sky is clear, isn't it? Actually, sky is not blue. Did you know that? Sky is not blue. Blue is in the sky. But sky or space is clear, isn't it? The, the, the sky is not cloudy. Right? The clouds are cloudy. Skies are in the uh, clouds are in the sky, correct? So that's the same with us. So this clear light mind is not really impure, but it's 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 constantly uh, obstructed from by these defilements we've called them. So now the defilements are all these mental factors like anger and jealousy and envy and and lust and distractions and you know, spite, greed. Anger, yes, greed, ignorance, doubt, pride, arrogance, haughtiness, harmfulness. Anyway, go on and on. Okay. So, so we don't really need to, in a way, it's kind of funny because it's about purifying the mind. The mind doesn't need any purifying, just like the sky doesn't need to be purified, does it? It's pure, but we got to get rid of all the smog. So we can see the clear sky. Okay. So, uh, so this is your guru. Okay. And we talk about guru. So the Buddha, and I'm not going to, again, not to be too technical, but I just want to sort of impress upon you that when we talk about Buddha or awakened, so when a being attains awakening, they attain, there's different descriptions of this, but one way of saying it is, they achieve the two bodies. And these bodies are not body necessarily. They're a collection of qualities. And one is called the Dharmakaya and one is called the Rupakaya, okay? So Buddha, whether you talk about Shakyamuni or any other Buddha, possesses or embodies the Dharmakaya and Rupakaya. Now, draw your attention to Rupakaya. Now, the Dharmakaya is the wisdom in Buddha's mind, the wisdom of his mind. Now, I say his, by the way, it's non, non-gender, okay? I don't think Buddha has a gender. It manifests a gender as female or male. I, I don't know if they manifest as neither also. I guess they do. So, um, so the Dharmakaya is, is this mind of the omniscient mind of the Buddha, which has, possesses all wisdom and all knowing, okay? 
And then, um, then the Rupakaya or the, the form body, which there's two different levels. Uh, one is the enjoyment body. This is for high bodhisattvas and they're in the pure lands. And what happens is the Buddha's omniscient mind will manifest as like a deity or, or some high, uh, highly evolved being maybe made out of light, right? Uh, or, you know, very subtle substances. And, that, and then that Buddha teaches in the Pure Lands for high bodhisattvas who can perceive that. See, so people often say, well, why if Jesus, you know, why doesn't Jesus, walk, Jesus come and walk along, walk upon the earth? Or why doesn't Buddha manifest? Well, they are. We can't see them. Okay, we don't have a subtle enough uh, mind to perceive uh, these highly evolved beings. So out of the, but you know, Buddha's, in the case of Buddha, only one, it's not a thought, but only one thing really possesses his mind, which is his bodhicitta, which is the great compassion to, to work for the benefit of all living beings. It's, in, it's not a conscious thought. It's just who he is or she. It's just, just like, we don't need to think about taking care of ourselves, do we? If you're hungry, you go to the fridge. If you're tired, you lie down. No one has to tell you lie down. You know, if you need to go to the store, you go, I'm going to the store. You get in your car, you go to the store. No one needs to tell you that. It's, it's fun. You know, breathe. You don't need to, no one needs to, you just breathe for your, but you're doing it all for yourself. Right? You do, you breathe because I don't want to die. If, if, if it was conscious, I mean. Or you go get a drink of water because you do. Uh, you don't need, you don't need to think, oh, that's right. I have to drink a, a glass of water for me. You don't do that. It's right. It's it's spontaneous. Okay. For Buddha, the thought of benefiting others is spontaneous. It's not contrived. It's like it's like not like me when I think, oh, I should, I should try to help that person, or you know, maybe I should be a therapist so I can maybe help people. Right? It's not like that. Okay. It's just a spontaneous. It's the nature of his mind or her mind. Now, because of the level, that level of kindness and compassion and commitment, altruism, as Denise said, um, of course, what, is, what about the rest of us who can't go to the pure lands or can't see? Them? So for the rest of us, he will manifest in an, as an emanation body, okay? As and even as an ordinary being. Yeah. And that's where we go back to where we started the class today, where Buddha said, well, after I die in the future, I will I will manifest through your through your teacher. Well, that's like an ordinary being. Okay. Any questions? I don't know what's what's hitting me really big right now is when you said we don't have um, a subtly evolved enough mind to see the omniscient beings. Correct. And the the reason in their is, pure form, yeah. I. Like, I feel like uh, we're, you know, we're taught all about the senses and how to just pay so much awareness to those senses in day-to-day non-meditative life. Mm -hmm. And then the more, the more I meditate, the more there's so much more than all those things. There's like these subtle new things, right? right? right. And and so when you went into that, you know, like the existence, subtle awareness, you hear people talking about fairies or talking about the ghosts or talking about these different things, it starts to bring that more into uh, sense making yeah. and conversation. Yes, that's right. That's right. Uh, yeah, because it's not that we can't experience these things. We can. And, and you know, to develop, you know, just it's a byproduct, by the way. 
So in a byproduct of cultivating and our cultivating the wholesome qualities of our mind, uh, byproduct of developing, you know, uh, concentration, samadhi, you know, calm abiding, is you're able to perceive these things that you couldn't perceive before. It's not the goal. Still, the goal is what's tricky is people can get distracted because all of a sudden they're seeing angels and bodhisattvas and deities and spirits and hell realms and and uh, you know because they exist because they exist they're they're objects of knowledge. Uh, but you know you can see how can you imagine if you or us develop even a little level that what happens you know just to go off on a tangent you know what happens to us westerners is there's nine levels in the development of calm abiding and you know as you get through the nine levels you're developing more and more insights and clairvoyances and you know because so like i always say you know i say it's that the clairvoyance is not a big deal it's just someone it's just information that, that's out there already and i often use the example of you know, if you took your if you took your smartphone into a culture that doesn't have that kind of level of technology, and you look at your smartphone and say, "Okay, it's going to rain tomorrow," and then it rains tomorrow, everyone's going to say, "Oh, Denise is clairvoyant, right?" <laughs> it's it's just information that you have access to. Right. So when the mind becomes quieter and quieter and pure, not just quiet, but pure, you're purifying the mind so that its clarity is becoming more obvious, more uh, in, uh, its clarity is becoming more dominant. Then you see the things you didn't see before. It's like, it's like uh, art. You know, I'll go into a museum and my daughter is a, an artist, you know, and also my wife, they go, oh, look at that and look at this. Or they look at a painting. And it's like, what? How do you see that? <laughs> you know? They'll point out this detail and that detail, and right? Or like people who go into, uh, you know, people who design houses, you know, or architect, and they'll come in and say, oh, well, they really shouldn't have put a t -t -t there because that, and you're looking and go, God, I've been in this house 30 years. I never noticed there was a, <laughs> a that, <laughs> whatever it is, right? And we say, oh, what a brilliant contractor. You know, it's just he he has access to the information. I don't. So um, how did I go on this tangent? There's a reason. Oh, so yes. Yeah, so you so having so uh, part of the I want again want to just make the imprint that for us Westerners, I know I was going to say. So and many many people I meet, you know, uh, because they don't have a spiritual guide develop a little tiny taste of something and they think they've attained enlightenment <laughs> or high level realization. I got a letter last week from an old friend and uh, I think I mentioned this class last week and, and uh, he was talking about what he'd realized now. Now he has this realization and it sounded like something, you know, pretty high. So, but they said, but I don't understand my wife. My wife thinks that I'm constantly stoned. <laughs> so <laughs> my experience of highly realized beings is they kind of have a little bit of that stoneness, I guess, but more they have a level of, of presence, you know, it's more presence. And uh, also when we, the, the higher, the more highly realized beings i know are the ones that claim they don't have any realizations so what is that about you know well it's like practicing buddhism but not calling yourself a buddhist yeah because you're practicing the not identifying have... as one specific thing that your ego might get attached to yeah we just don't advertise you know the more a person advertises i think the more, better create some distance yeah so we have spiritual teachers and they're renowned, they're well-known, they're famous, they're charismatic. And uh, they, gosh, it's really strange. You know, after living so long in Nepal and in my early years, right, especially in being with Lama Yashin, Lama Zobrimshay for, for many years, you know, 
uh, and other lamas there personally, day after day. And then to come back to the West and people are claiming to be gurus and teachers because they did a three-year retreat or because they had some realization. You know, maybe they do, but I, I just, it, I'm, I'm, I guess I'm a bit cautious, you know, I'm a bit jaded. So, and I see people get hurt by people like that, you know. So are you saying, am I hearing a bit of advice that says, Watch the non-beginner mind person. Yeah, I think always. Whether be, I think I think you just don't go on. Don't. We're going to talk about that. You know, in terms of our work here and spiritual. Like, yes, um, I told you my story of my first t- Rinpoche I met in Nepal, right? About the uh, yeah, about the fly, right? I don't remember right now. (laughs) So I was uh, I was um, so I'm a product of the 60s, 70s, and um, before I went to Nepal in 1975, I had become very involved in the yoga Hindu tradition. Oh yeah, yeah, and so uh, so I was very excited that my college had a year in Nepal program, and it was but but so. But when I got to, got to Nepal, I wasn't so into the, the Hindu thing anymore because I'd had a bit of a falling out. And one of my friends, so we all studied um, intense of Nepalese language and we all lived with the Nepalese family, you know, this immersion, this whole immersion program. It was, it was awesome. And so my buddy, his project was, he was an artist. So he lived with a, a family. They were renowned for their Tonka painting, you know, the Tibetan Buddhist uh, art uh, painting tonkas so yeah so he invited me over one day because i started to get interested in, like what's this buddhism thing so he he invited me to his his family's house because the father he was living with was a rinpoche he was not a monk he was which you find in in tibetan tradition some traditions um have uh, lamas that are not ordained monks and he he had a and he had two sons and so this lama was um Rinpoche, you know, he was, he was, he was well-known, you know, in that community. And I don't think, he, I don't think he was a big, he was, wasn't a teaching Lama per se, but, but anyway. Uh, so I asked him a question because I was very into the guru. I've always been into this, this topic. And I'd had kind of a falling, a difficult experience with a guru prior to that in, in, in California, uh, he, uh, an Indian, very kind man, very kind man, but it, went sideways a little bit so um so i told him i'm not told him i asked him how do you find a guru that's all our questions i think it still exists today probably that question and he looked at me and he said well when you're looking for a guru and you find a teacher you need to examine him i'd never heard that before because in the Hindu tradition, when my, I understood the Hindu tradition was is all faith based, right? He said, "No, you have to examine the teacher, and then you examine him some more, and then you examine him some more, and then you examine him for quite some time. And if you find a mistake in him, nail him to the wall like a fly." That was yeah. And I thought, "Oh my God." <laughs> <laughs> like that's like so Tibetan, you know. They're just like ah, oh, cut to the chase. But I'd not, I'd been, you know, not exposed to that kind of thinking. Yeah, and of course they're nonviolent. He means it metaphorically, you know. But wow, I didn't know I had that permission. So I want to tell every Westerner that story. So I want to understand that clearly. Nail him to the wall like a fly means call him on it. Yeah. Yeah. Got it. Yep. Don't be naive is what he's saying. Be educated. Mm-hmm. Educate yourself. But but you always do it. Uh, uh, there is a there is a caveat to that. You always do it with respect. Not with arrogance and pride, always with respect, because you don't know, you know, he may be very highly realized being and also he may be very helpful. He or she might be very helpful to other people, but just not for you, you know. So it's, you, you, I think nail on the wall like a fly means 
maybe in your mind, maybe it's not appropriate to do it publicly, you know, or even, to, you know, that might not be appropriate, but it might be too. But we have to be skillful, we have to be kind, we have to be respectful. No matter what, we have to be respectful. No matter what they, you know, uh, yeah, because they're, they're trying to represent spiritual tradition. They're trying. And they, and they may be, and we may just be flawed, but, but we have to live with that flaw, you know. We have to acknowledge it. Yes, Barbara. Um, so how do you navigate this kind of, um, you know, seeing your teacher as omniscient uh -huh. and at the same time scrutinizing them? Like, that seems like a little, that that would get a little tricky. Yeah. So I, I'm, I'm addressing that, okay? Uh so in the presentation that I'm giving in this uh, relying on a spiritual teacher, um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm accessing Alex, Alex Burzen's um, paper that he wrote many, many years ago on trying to clarify about the spiritual teacher from the Tibetan Buddhist, well, from the Buddhist standpoint, because he himself also saw this confusion that was arising. And so I, I don't know if he came up with these labels or they're from, if all of them are from uh, some Buddhist, he does quote some Buddhist texts, but I'm, I'm thinking he's extrapolating from them. So these are the eight uh, teacher. So when we say guru, it could be any of these eight or all or a mixture of these eight. Okay. So we have Buddhist professors. And by the way, don't don't get hung up on um, don't get hung up on uh, sorry, I just got distracted. Don't get hung up on uh, the exact wording. Okay, it, it's a concept. Okay, it's not strict. So this is to help us understand uh, Barbara. Your part of part of uh, part of this is to understand Barbara's question. So we got Buddhist professors, we got Dharma instructors, we got meditation or ritual trainers, we have spiritual mentors, we have refuge or vow preceptors, we have Mahayana masters, and we have we have tantric masters, and then the root guru. For us Westerners, traditionally, uh, not traditionally, sorry, for us Westerners, until you study quite a bit it seems these get all mixed up together. Okay, or a number of them get mixed up with each other, right? Now, with all of these, with all of these, if you feel, not if, if you perceive that your guru is Buddha, and there is something about the qualities of Buddha that if you rely on him, I'm just saying him, I hope that's not off-putting to say him or her, but um, and if you rely on him or you rely on her, you know, you go uh, in your mind, even right now, is you, you take refuge in them, right? You, you, you rely, rely on them, okay? So the interesting thing is I will promise you based on the strength of your reliance you will be guided by that omniscient mind that omniscient mind will find some way to communicate with you okay i know it's, it might sound a bit mystical to some people but it is mystical because we generally don't have that i mean i remember as a kid <laughs> I don't know what I was doing, but, you know, like, do you ever do that thing where, you know, you kneel down by your bed and you prayed to God because, you know, your parents were fighting or someone next door was sick or something like that? Well, it is kind of like that. The, the, the difference is that the God you're praying to doesn't have probably that ability. And, and by the way, it doesn't mean that Buddha can't, you know, if you, if you rely on Buddha to guide you, not to have you win the lottery, okay, not to help you find a a partner Th those things could happen but that's not that's not the point buddha is there to be relied on as your spiritual guide to enlightenment so if you're asking something from buddha that's not directly related to your enlightenment it may not happen right but if you ask 
or you request or rely on the Buddha as your teacher to, to guide you to enlightenment, it will happen. It will happen. Okay. So we'll come back to this point I'm going to make many times, but I, and I still work on it myself. So, so I rely on Buddha as my guru. When I sit and with Lama Zopa Rinpoche, who I think is a Buddha, but I don't know. I think maybe he's just a really good qualified uh, medium because he's so pure. So for me, I feel like I'm being taught, the Buddha's talking to me through Lama Zopa Rinpoche. Now, now, there is this other thing I think implied in Barbara's question, but what about from their side? So let's not worry about that at the moment. Okay, let's, move, worry, let's more consider about the fact that you want to be taught and guided by Buddha. So if you, if you're, um, if you're, re, if you uh, relate to a professor of Buddhism, that Buddha is teaching you through that person, you get, te- you get taught by the Buddha. Great. But you know that objectively speaking, you're not, can't be sure that's Buddha. So um, in the case of that, you know, if that professor starts to do, you know, strange things that don't fit with your understanding, you have total permission to, to back out and say, okay, well, thanks, Buddha. <laughs> thanks for showing me that. You know what I mean? Uh, now, there is a place where that becomes less, um, less defined, and that's at the higher levels of Buddha, Guru Yoga, okay, which we're not touching on at the moment. So Buddhist professors, these are the people who are your, your next step after you've seen all the YouTube videos and uh, read some books, listened to recordings, you know. And you need someone who can answer your questions, some questions. Um, so this is a Buddhist, and then this is kind of like a, uh, someone who imparts information to you because you're curious. You know, we say this is very beginning level. Maybe they provide lectures, talks. So they may be a Geshe, they may be a Lama, they may be a Kempo, okay? Right? But when you're going to that class or that environment, you're going as a student, a curiosity student. You're not going as necessarily a Buddhist student, right? So people have gotten this really confused at all these levels and say, oh, wow, now you've met your guru or something. You know, this is just really dangerous. No. You don't have an obligation. Again, as I said uh, some time ago, always have respect. Let alone just even if their behavior is wild and, you know, you don't really like them maybe or something or they seem weird, you know, but but they're they are they are. um, They are the vehicle. For you to hear this content. And this content, in fact, may be something that really benefits you long. You know, maybe it leads you to another teacher. Maybe it leads you to a center. Maybe it leads you to a retreat. Maybe a light bulb goes off on one idea, right? That helps your life. So that's why you would have to, you know, not have to, but it's to your benefit uh, to maintain respect of that person. It's to your benefit. It doesn't matter to them. I mean, you're not doing it for them. Okay. In a way, you're doing it for you in a, in, a, in a twisted kind of selfless way because it's benefiting you. I said to, um, I said to Lama Zopra Mpche some years ago, I was ca- talking to him about um, The Misleading Mind, the book that I wrote. And uh, one of my Dharma friends she said to me, she's the only one that said this, but I, I, I knew what she was on to. She said, you know, Karuna, the Mislima is really, it's a really good book, but it's not a, but it's not Dharma. 
And the reason she said it was what I was talking to you all about in the beginning, what defines something as Dharma. And the reason she said is, is, is because I don't talk about future lives, right? I talk about reincarnation. I don't, you know, the motivation is get well in this life, right? It, you know, that's what most of the intent of the book looks at. So it presents psych, Buddhist psychology and it presents some philosophy, uh, but doesn't say, hey, you know, you need to think of your future lives for this to really work. It's not the point. It was, it's more like a bridge book, right? So I said to Rinpoche what this, this friend of mine had said, and I was sure that Rinpoche was going to back her up because I knew when I wrote the book, I knew all that, right? And Rinpoche said, oh, no, I think it's Dharma. <laughs> so why did he say that? The reason he said that is because he explained. He said, well, through the book, you're leading people to develop compassion. And through compassion, they, it'll affect their future lives. So you're helping them create the causes. So that's, I'm not saying, so that is true. Like, you know, you, you can have, I mean, the, the um, qualified spiritual guide guides on many, no, I'm not saying me. I didn't mean to imply that. <laughs> that sounds like a weird segue. But the, pro, the, 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 um, the real spiritual guide might just give you a cup of tea. Because that at your level, I watch this with Lama Yeshi all the time. My mother loved Lama Yeshi. She was not a Buddhist. My father would really respected Lama Yeshi. He wasn't a Buddhist. Okay. So the Buddha, this omniscient mind, when, when you have a link between that omniscient mind and someone who's actually attained it, or a highly realized being, then you get some amazing experiences. But you ha we have to start with saying, whoever that is, that's Buddha, my Buddha guru, teaching me. Without being naive, that objectively maybe they don't. Then, but then you have uh, the combination of someone who is highly attained and pure, and then the, the omniscient mind speaking through them or with them uh, becomes one, you know, becomes kind of one with the person. Does that make sense? So Buddhist professors, okay? Now, from then, you know, from there, you become interested, right? And I want to say you, this is just, you know, a generic you, right? This could be the way it goes. So, or maybe even, you know, yeah. So this could be the way it goes. Like, you know, I think with, with Barbara and Denise, you know, um, you know, who you identify as Dharma instructor is this class. I'm uh, sorry, not Dharma. Uh, is this class of just, uh, is a, is a, is a level of a professor, you know, could be. So then a Dharma instructor is when you are saying, you know, these ideas are pretty profound. Uh, are pretty interesting, I should say, maybe not profound. And then, so then you become uh, the Dharma instructor is someone now who is going to help you develop a discriminating awareness through listening and reading books. So now all of a sudden, you know, you, your level of, of, in, of engagement is deeper. Okay. It's not just you're there in the classroom, so to speak. Listen, oh, that's an interesting idea. Oh, yeah, what about karma? Whatever. That's interesting realization. I mean, uh, um, reincarnation. So now a Dharma instructor is helping you develop discriminating awareness through listening and reading books, through thinking about the correct information, right? And you might even have a dialogue back and forth. Yeah, what do you mean by this? And what about that? Just like we do here. And then, the, on a, and then you have to, ah, developing discriminating awareness through experience and insight derived from meditating okay you can see the difference between being in a classroom that's why professors you know in sort of the typical sense they're probably not even buddhists right 
You go to university, that, that kind of level. Now, they might be Buddhist too, like the example of a Kempo Lama you know, or Lama that you're just, you're there with them as a professor. There might be other people in the audience that are there with a different level with that, that, that teaching or that Lama, but that's not what you're there for. You're there because you're curious. What is this Buddhism thing? Okay. Not only Buddhism, but maybe a particular topic too. Um, so these Dharma instructors, they're going to help you in, uh, in applying these to your life. Okay, it's now we're going beyond the intellectual. Okay. So these may be older spiritual seekers. They may be resident teachers. They may be visiting or touring teachers, right? You know, now I haven't used... Now, again, you're still going to bring your same, your same mindset, whether it's the professor, now it's a Dharma instructor, and you're going to say, oh, Buddha's, my guru is Buddha. My uh, Buddha is my guru. And, I, and now you're sitting in and, and you're getting a class from this person instructing you in a meditation technique, say. But meditation technique, because you're going from the purely intellectual to you want to go into the experiential. Okay. I've noticed that uh, in, our, in our FPMT, maybe Shayla, I don't know, or maybe anybody can say, I think we have all these levels. So far, we have both levels, right? We have some, maybe even they're long-term students, but they don't seem to be able to, um, you know, present beyond the level of the professor, the information, the curious. Okay, maybe not. But, but this is, okay, so now those are the Dharma instructor. When we talk about a spiritual mentor, we're going in deeper. Okay, now a spiritual mentor, now to be a Dharma instructor, you don't necessarily have to have realizations yourself, right? You don't need to. So for someone to instruct you, in uh, how to do Tonglen meditation or meditation on death and dying or, med or how to um, fill water bowls, right? So that can be a Dharma instructor, how to do prostration. But you don't have to be realized, you don't have to have realizations to teach those things necessarily, right? I'm not saying it's better. Of course, it's better. So when we get to the point of your spiritual mentor, this is someone now you're relying on and it's to help you develop uh, your own insight. So the spiritual mentor, mentors are, are, um, have developed realizations of the teachings. Now, Insight does when you talk about insight and realizations, insight does not really change your life. And this is what a lot of Americans are into insight. They think they have an insight that it's a big deal. It's great, right? But it's not a realization. Okay. Realization is something that is an insight in a sense that's integrated into your life. And it's and it's and it's and it's an, an improvement that lasts, it really changes. Okay, realization will change you. So when you see someone's improved, right? Uh, say just in the, in the in the Buddhist in the Dharma practice, it's because they have some kind of realization. I'm not. It doesn't be. I'm not talking about high realization or low realization, but it's like. Um, well, I can ask. Um, Denise, do you fish? Do you personally fish? Oh God, that one's so hard, Corona. Oh, you, you don't. You do. Do you? Okay, maybe I should ask. <laughs> uh, well, you guys need to know my son no, is the you, most you, avid no, fisherman no. out there, and just this last weekend, for the first time in like three years. He handed me a poll and said, do you want to reel it in, mom? And what'd you do? And I got it 
it fell off the hook. <laughs> oh, good. Do you fish though? <laughs> Do you fish? Not the fisherman anymore. Okay. Why? I can't stand the possible the I feel like I see the karma in it. Okay, so that's so that's a realization, you see? It changed your life. It's integrated in your life. So you're, it's an improvement that lasts. Okay? I often tell the story of my older son asking me when he was like 15 if, if why I don't still get stoned. I didn't have any, it wasn't a value judgment that I, or something that I quit smoking. It's because it, it, di it didn't make me feel good anymore. That's the, uh, and it made me feel foggy. And it interrupted my, it, what little clarity I have through meditation practice. It, 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 it spoiled that for days. So that's a realization. Okay. That's what caffeine does to mine. <laughs> right. Um, so, uh, so what makes it a Dharma realization is again, do I, what do I do with that clarity of mind? Do I use it for the benefit of others? Right. Mm -hmm. That's, that would make, or do I at least that clarity of mind I use to attain a higher rebirth or, or Denise's, um, um, uh, what's that word? Denise's avoidance of fishing, you know, does it, does it for future lives and, um, for your future life and also just set a sense of compassion for the fish's future life, then that's a Dharma practice. Okay? I set the worms free. Yeah, exactly. Why? Because it makes you feel better or because it makes you really concerned about them and future lives. You know, I'm just, I'm just teasing you. I'm just saying that, you know, the more we can generate even more deeper motivation for saving the, the worms, you know what I mean? Uh, and the fish who don't, you know what? It's interesting. Someone once asked uh, in Nepal, you know, you got a lot of spiders and things and a lot of insects during, during um, monsoon. In the wintertime, it's, it's like here uh, in California, but um, summer, it's very tropical. And I remember I was a very new student there and there was a, spy, uh, a moth that got caught in a spider's web. And I saw one of the monks freeing, freeing the moth. And I said, oh, well, but you're denying the spider food. The spider might die, starve. And he said, yeah, but I, I prevented the spider from killing. So future, it has a chance not to be a spider. <laughs> so that's the kind of... That's the kind of discussion. That's how things shift. Okay. People always say, you know, I, I believe in killing my own meat. You know, that's, that's ethical. <laughs> There's maybe some ethical thing in there, but I don't know. And I mean, they say ethical because, uh, yeah, you know, they love the animals. And so better I, I kill the animal than have someone kill it and that sort of thing. I don't know maybe it's maybe it's good it's not good because either way you kill is not good right i mean there's karmic there's karmic repercussions let's put it that way i think but maybe it's better because you don't order someone else to do it that's that's heavy too that's heavy karma too anyway not to go there sorry my bad okay so spiritual mentors uh dar now dharma instructors may have either insight or realization, but they may not. But spiritual mentors, mentors do have insight and realization, okay? They help, and then the spiritual mentor, you can see they help students develop their personalities. It's not just delivering content, okay? Uh, spiritual mentors need to have some level of realization. They teach verbally, but more, not more important, but as importantly, they they teach through their realizations they embody the teachings or some of the teachings or part of the teachings because they're because they're practitioners they teach through example of their life they're in their inspiration inspirers how about them inspirers their inspirations would that be like um a Geshe or like Geshe or Geshe Sharab? yeah um well, here's the interesting thing on that. Let's move out of here for a second. So 
um, what the beautiful thing is that we cannot judge what someone's attainments are, can we? So, so this is, um, I, I guess I should help people hear me say this if they're going to watch this later, is we have to always, remember, we have to, so Shayla, so your, your uh, Buddha is going to be your guru, right? And then you listen to Geshe Sherab and, and you, be, due, to the purity, due to the purity of your motivation, you have a chance of getting teachings from Buddha, don't you? If you don't think that, you won't, you won't get teachings from Buddha. In, I mean, directly, you, indirectly, yeah. But you could sit there and go, wow, I'm getting teachings from Buddha. I really, and you might have that experience, not in a naive way, but actually, oh, you know, and so Geshe Sherab, yes. So Geshe Sherab, so we don't know what Geshe Sherab is or isn't. Now, I would say we have to judge. I mean, we have to not be naive. For me, Geshe Sherab is a practitioner. You know, he's attained uh, actualizations of the path. He's not just a, he doesn't seem to be just a, uh, a professor, does he? Yeah. He seems his lifestyle man manifests, doesn't it? He walks the walk. He walks the walk. Yeah. yeah, and 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 we have to we have to also understand we have to do that if we're trying to impart spiritual you know if we're a teacher we have to try as best we can and uh, you know we're all at different levels and we're still practicing some of us so we might make mistakes right uh, making a mistake is is not the worst thing the worst thing is hiding it through your arrogance through your um, through your God, I'm not getting my words I'm not coming. Sorry, through your um, well, you know, grandstanding and faking pe to people out. You know, it's just so much is on. So I think better to 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 be very disclosing about your mistakes. Actually, you know, so so no one has any misunderstanding. Uh, a funny little story, Shayla, is that you know, Geshe Sherab. Uh, I've known for hmm, about 42 years <laughs> he was my he was one of my students in in copan you know no way that's amazing yeah, yeah you can ask him about it say ask him uh let's see let's see he at one point we got a little older he he graduated to being like the office manager so we'd have to do a lot of a lot of uh accounting together bookkeeping and you know people know me bookkeeping is like that's a joke, but you know, there I was the bookkeeper in the monastery and uh, that was so funny, but yeah, we, yes. Yeah, so uh, he's very, 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 very sweet, sincere, really sincere, good Lama. Yeah. Um, so kind, isn't he? Yeah. Uh, okay. Okay, so these are spiritual mentors. Yes. More about spiritual mentors, perhaps after gaining practical knowledge. Oh, sorry. So for us to, to connect, to commit, or to, to study with a spiritual mentor, we do at this level, we have acquired some practical knowledge about the spiritual path. We study the Dharma with instructors and ritual trainers. Now we're ready to become disciples. <coughs> so spiritual mentors uh, are, and the implication is they have disciples or students, okay? So with a spiritual mentor, this is very, very important, is they do need to have the qualities of a guru, a lama, and spiritual, a spiritual friend. Um, not based on some title they have. This is the problem with us Westerners, us Americans in particular. We have someone has a title, oh, title, oh, he's a tuku. I'm really sorry. Have respect, but don't, don't put them on a pedestal yet. Go through all that other stuff we were talking about. And you know what? People don't listen to me, right? They're not going. People are not going to listen to me. They're going to want to. They. It's like they want to put people on a pedestal. Karuna's being too critical. He's being judgmental. He's being disrespectful. Okay, 
I don't care if people say that. I've seen too many people get hurt by putting uh, a teacher on a pedestal, a person on a pedestal because they have the name Rinpoche, or they named Tuku, they have named Kempo, they did three year retreat, right? Am I being off track here? Not at all. I want to protect people. It gets, it's so painful. Maybe for their whole life, it's painful to be, um, to be uh, betrayed. Now, there's a lot of things going on there. It's also due to their karma, but it can be avoided. It might've been able to be avoided. So they need the qualities. What are the qualities? We're going to go into that next week, okay? Um, it's not based on some title they have. Now, the disciple, disciple, what makes you a disciple? Is you're making a formal commitment to the Buddhist path. So again, and maybe you guys can help me out here better because I'm, I'm more isolated. But I think there's a lot of students say, oh, so-and-so is my guru. Oh, yeah. Well, are you, and then you say, are you committed to the spiritual path, the Buddhist path? And they might say, well, I like a lot of the things there. Well, and, and I'm going to be nasty here for a minute or, or tradition. What you sh should ask is, have you taken refuge in the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha? That's really kind of rude, isn't it? But I'm saying that for you guys. <laughs> you know, I'm not saying I would say that to the person, right? Because many people say, well, I don't know. I'm not really sure. But uh and or have you taken the five lay vows have you taken the precepts have you taken some of it have you taken refuge vows if they say i don't not yet i don't know then uh they have not made maybe i'm being judgmental but they probably have not committed to the buddhist path they're ones like say oh, i really like buddhism people say a lot which I, is great yeah i really like what buddhism is. if i was religious that would be the religion i would choose my dad used to say that Okay, but that didn't make him committed to the Buddhist path. Committed to the Buddhist path involves some pretty formal commitments. So we're, we, shouldn't, we shouldn't ask, we shouldn't expect people to commit. It's fine. But once you get to this place and uh, you want to rely on the, your spiritual mentor, you have a commitment, just like they have a commitment. Okay, you don't have a commitment when it's Dharma instructor. Okay, you don't have a commitment when it's a Buddhist professor. So you're fine, don't worry. But get to now, we're getting to this sort of deeper level of a spiritual mentor. There's now going to start coming some responsibilities. Okay, in this, Alex's articulation of this. Now, there's some lamas, they've described three different kinds of spiritual mentors based upon um, the vows they impart, okay? Uh, don't worry about this too much. I think this is nice content. That's why I'm sharing it with you. Uh, you don't have to rely on it um, uh, strictly, but more like uh, help you discern what this next level of, of spiritual teacher is. So a spiritual mentor, some talk about, well, the vows that the you know when you take the vows uh pratimoksha vows which are like the, the lay vows or the monks vow the, the ordained vows right so there's a that's one kind of um uh you could you could look at a spiritual mentor on that level you know and according to these designations or a, a spiritual mentor that, that imparts the bodhisattva vows Be, the reason here or imparts the tantric vows the reason here is because to take these vows, you're making a commitment, right? You're not going to take these vows if you're not committed to the Buddhist path. Makes no sense. You know. So, yeah, you're taking these vows because your belief in the Buddhist teachings and Buddhist path. And it doesn't mean you believe in it all entirely. That that's but you're saying, okay, I I get I think that. Uh, you, your doubt is minim minimal to your belief, okay? You can still have doubt, but it's just not 
dominant. So we have this, and then uh, you have refuge, bodhisattva, tantric vows are all for all one's lifetimes until enlightenment. You see, it's not for this lifetime. Okay. Now the lay vows are for this lifetime. The pratimoksha, uh, when I it says pratimoksha there, that, that includes ordain, uh, uh, monks and nuns vows as well as lay vows five lay precepts of uh, not killing not stealing not engaging in sexual misconduct uh, and not lying and not taking intoxicants the not taking intoxicants is uh, it has different interpretations uh-huh um, when I took it and when you take these you, you only take them once by the way the lay vows if you break them, which we do, uh, then you you purify them, but you can't take them again. Um, bodhisattva vows, you can take again. Tantric vows, you can take again. But uh, lay vows and the monks or, ordain the, the um, root pratimoksha vows, you, you can't, you just take them once. You can give them up. People do give up their ordination vows. But for there for one lifetime, okay. This lifetime, okay. So what does it mean then if you take a bodhisattva vows from a particular teacher? Well, you can take the bodhisattva vows. Actually, uh, you don't need to take them from a teacher. Actually, uh, in 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 truth, you can take them uh, yourself in front of an image of the Buddha or, or Tonka or some holy objects that you commit to the bodhisattva way of life, you know, to the, to either the aspiring, aspiring bodhicitta or the engaging bodhicitta. Mm -hmm. But tantric vows, of course, there you're taking with a, a person, you know, a tantric master. Okay. So that last line, so the bond with a spiritual mentor is more serious. Now we're getting to that, you know, that, that bond you have. Okay. Okay. Any questions? We're up, we're up, up to the end. Did I get everyone uncomfortable with that? No? Barbara, how are you doing? I'm, I'm doing okay. Um, I feel like... Um, this requires a lot of like insight on my part to say, I need a, I need a professor or a, you know, like, and I don't even know what, I don't even, I don't even know. But uh, you're doing the, you're doing the right thing. You, you do. I don't want to, I don't want to, um, <laughs> I don't want to say you're wrong, but you do know you're doing the right thing. Here you are looking, getting information, finding out more, you know, I, I realize that, you know, my style is maybe I'm, it can be overwhelming. No, no, that's, I, uh, you know, I, I grew up in the country and uh -huh. all the, mostly guys, because it's, you know, it's the, uh, like, if you want to learn how to work on cars, you hung out at somebody's garage. Right. And there's a process in that that's like, you have to be resolute. You have to keep uh -huh. going back. You have to find interest in it. And you have to see this person as like somebody who really knows what they're doing. Great example. So I, like it. I don't know where to hang out. I read books. I come to these little classes, you know, and I don't, but I don't know, like, and I don't know, I don't know how to construct my life around this. You know, uh -huh. like, do I, you know, uh, growing up in a Christian faith, it's like my whole family was of that faith and we had our own little customs and things. So here I am like, you know, on my own with my husband and, you know, I'm trying to figure out like, how can I do this? Yeah, you know, yeah. you know, do I want to say I have a guru now? Right. <laughs> like, it's like, I, there's like a certain vulnerability. Sure. To, that's why um, I'm, yeah, like that's investigating I, this. Yeah. I think, uh, appreciate that. I think that's why I really feel committed to people like you, um, because it's, it's raw and it's new and it's not it's not 
you know, something that just is natural for us, right? And where do you live? I'm in Scottsdale, but I'm moving to Pennsylvania. Uh, I'm in Arizona, but I'm moving to Pennsylvania within a month. So, uh -huh. um, yeah. So, so let me give you, I, I don't think you have to worry because number one is you have access to this, these kinds of um, teachings, instructions, content. Just, just be keep being curious. Mm -hmm. Don't worry about the guru. And I mean, be with professors right now, or my other one with Dharma instructors. Those two, you know, that's 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 why I have that up there. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in in traditionally, I think this should give some heart. Is that when one would take on a take on a real guru, you know, like like that 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 level of tantric master or root guru or you know we'll talk about Mahayana master traditionally you know uh to, to to take on a guru took 12 years you know and that's not that's not uh some fantasy that was how it was and it might still be that way because even though we might think we have a relationship with the guru it might not be you know really solidified and i can explain that next time uh what that means it might take 12 years to actually have a guru disciple relationship. So uh, a lot of people have a relationship with a very profound teacher or a teacher. It might not be at that level yet, even though they may think so of guru disciple, because you have to check each other out. And so the, the, the teacher him, him or herself doesn't mean they accept you either. So we're talking about a very high level highly realized teacher, which is really what we want to be in relationship with. That doesn't happen because I choose him or her as my guru. It doesn't. And people think that all the time. Oh yeah. So-and-so is my guru. It's good. But if, and I would never burst their bubble, but I'm going to tell you something. It's much more sensitive than that. Much more sensitive. It's not easy to actually, I'm talking about the tantric level or the master level. It's not easy it's not easy to be to have that relationship. It takes time to develop. So my point is you're doing the right thing. Doing the right thing. Yeah. I think that like, you know, realistically, like maybe earlier in my life I would have. I was adventurous, but like right now, I don't see myself going and studying in Tibet. You know, like I know a lot of a lot of the teachers here have were like you know, in Tibet with for years and years and years. And so Nepal, probably Nepal, yeah. Nepal and India. Yeah, Nepal. I'm sorry. Yeah. So like, you know, the idea is, is like, given where I'm at, where I'm at in my life, in my age, in my like education level, it's like, you know, I don't really know what, you know, what can be done. You don't um, need to know. You don't need to <laughs> worry. Don't need to worry. You, you would never know, by the way. You, one never knows, do they? Yeah. So you're just just the point is stay open just have an open mind and just have fun you know have fun it's it's so amazing it's so curious my uh next uh sorry day after tomorrow i leave for australia where my wife is from because we're going for my father-in-law's 95th birthday he's still taking four university classes at a time and i'm talking about philosophy astronomy uh natural sciences at at the age of i think it must have been about 88 he started a meditation group <laughs> he's Love not it. he's not i don't know i don't know if he's buddhist i, I mean i would say he's probably i don't know i don't think he would call himself buddhist but he loves buddhism just like all of us he loves studying it and he, he's always putting me on the spot and and you know we'll be at a dinner at dinner and you know, some friends and he'll say, Hey, Hey, Karuna, tell them about the mind. Tell them, come on, tell them about the mind. <laughs> so they all have their, they all have their beers out and they have their, you know, their, their, their lamb chops. And, uh, and I'm supposed to tell them about the mind. <laughs> <laughs> so don't worry. You don't yeah, worry. That's, that's another thing. It's like, you know, sometimes I question, do, do I need a teacher? Don't to worry give about value it. to other people, you know, like to what? To do what? I need a teacher to be of value to other people. Like, can I, can I oh, no. find my way no. through all of this through, no, no, no. And through classes? 
And uh, yeah, I'm one of the people that is going that are going back to school at my age, and I don't think it's fine. I'm going back. Yeah. No, you don't. Don't yeah. worry about any of that. You know, I think that this is also probably why um, it's a difficult topic to teach why it's pushed back in the modules. And I think it's very courageous of you. This is the kind of kind of situation, you know, it's more, it's a, it's a, it's the, one of the most sensitive topics, isn't it? Um, for Westerners, you know, we can talk about karma is much easier to talk about, even though we might not so reincarnation is easier. Uh, emptiness is easier. All those are easier to talk about. This is a tough one yeah. because it's cult culturally, culturally it's, it's uh, it doesn't fit our culture, so don't worry. I'm I'm thrilled that you're here with an open mind. It's amazing. I I think that I'm like a person who processes and connects the dots. So it's like yeah. you know I see similarities from this to this and correspondences from that to that, and Buddhism seems to be the context for me to just bring it all together and, yeah. and fit all the pieces together. It's like this is where I can build the puzzle. But I do think that I need help with it. I just don't, you know, I, I don't know how to go about it. And I don't know what I need or if I need it now or later. And it's like, those are the kinds of uh, questions. That yeah. Like yeah. Me. Well, you are going about it. And if you trust, um, I think you, the help will come. I know my friend, Denise, very similar, you know, not that long ago as you. And here she is. And she plods along and she goes to this side and that side and then finds that side's not so comfortable but this side is comfortable okay i'm glad i tried that side now i know it now i know i don't like mint julep you know it's like <laughs> but i really like horseradish so um right that's all you need to do and that she's been doing that and going through this is confusing and that's confusing ah what do i do that's all part of it don't worry you know okay. don't, don't awesome. thank that. you yeah. Is I okay? Stay That's in like, touch with me, Barbara. Yeah. Stay in touch <laughs> with me. Sound like the same mentality as me so much. Yes. And that that is actually another thing. It's like, you know, is that encouraged to you know talk with other students in these oh, classes? 100%. 100%. 100%. Building our sangha. Yeah. Shayla, that's right. Am I saying something wrong? No, I for me, I feel like I'm kind of cheating because in I'm I'm kind of going off of F, um, F, I can't say it, foundation, the foundation. FPMT. Uh, thank you. Um, to kind of screen the teachers a little bit, you know? Um, and so, so for me, it feels like, okay, I know I've got trusted information. Now I just need to kind of work on what I want mm -hmm. because taking baths is kind of a scary thing. Yeah. Yeah. Go slow. I tell every, everybody, go slow. Don't worry. Go slow. Just, just slowly improve. Uh, you know, Lami Yeshi, <laughs> Lami Yeshi used to, <laughs> he used to say, he used to say, where did all these mushroom students come from? <laughs> You know what I mean? You know, they just kind of pop up out of the dark. And also then they just die. Do you know what I mean? It's like, like, I mean, rot. So his point was, take your time. And don't just like, I think, oh, I, mentioned, I, lost. I, think I mentioned about Malcolm X, right? Malcolm X, if you read his biography, very interesting. There's a woman who sat in the back row of his church week after week after week. And then they would challenge him from the back row. And finally, his Malcolm X's disciples said, why do you keep her here? You should ask her to leave. And he said, no, no, no. When she converts, she'll be the most devoted. <laughs> she, converted, she converted and she was most devoted because he says the ones that are hardest to, to recruit are the ones that last the longest. So don't be, we should They're be discerning. Mushroom. Yeah, we don't want to be mushroom students. Pop up in the dark. <laughs> Okay, so let's um, let's just think for a moment that we want to uh, generate a mind that thinking of the welfare of others. We are, uh, it doesn't matter. We understand all this blah blah that I'm saying. I'm not even sure what I said was right or not. 
that's up to you to, to just use your discernment to uh, uh, dis discriminate, you know, the, the what's useful for you, maybe even what's true, what's not true on a relative level. And the main thing is with a good heart, I'm doing this so that my own consciousness evolves and develops into its full potential, which we call full potential, we just call Buddha, Buddhahood, omniscient. And then I'm not going to just disappear into the ether, but instead I'm going to manifest for the welfare of all, constantly manifest for the welfare of all beings because all beings are in trouble. All people, all beings are saturated with problems and they will be forever. That's the nature of samsara or the world. It just doesn't go away on its own. We have to make it go away. So dedicate like that. All the energy we've generated together. Okay, thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. See you next week from Australia. <laughs> Wonderful. Yeah. Thank you so 